the CTO of a company called Trove, life logging things. Jim was the co-creator of My Life Bits with Gordon Bell. If you were in my lectures, you came across My Life Bits and you knew what this was. Um, Jim was one of the legendary life logging founders. He started off part of this process. I put Jim up there with, uh, with Gordon and with Richard Buckminster Fuller and those kind of guys in terms of life log legends. So I'm not going to spend much time up here. As you listen to Jim, Jim is going to give us a talk around about 40 minutes on the work on life logging and the internet of things. And then we'll throw the floor open to questions about life logging, trove, and even about what it's like to be a CTO in Silicon Valley. Right, thank you. Ms. Cahill. Um, I'm gonna, we're small enough here that feel free to interrupt me and get out of this what you want. I'm gonna just rip through a bunch of stuff hoping to get to questions. Um, what I'm intending to talk about is why do new things emerge? And I think all of us in the room as technologists tend to get focused around enabling technology and we see the promise of our research and we get really excited we say oh yeah this is coming and then there's the flip side that I've been out in the world of business and seeing where okay what does that meet with what's the reason why for the consumer and so I want to talk today through a few examples of uh, the PC the emergence of the personal computer and the reason why behind that and then talk about what enables kind of new technological um, eras uh, and then what it means for life logging, which as Cal said, it started for myself many years ago, uh, looking at the whole world of my life bits. And we, you know, we're very early in Europe. So many of you are continuing that on now. Um, but then also, and how is that done? What did we think would happen? What did happen? And then look at, well, what does that mean for thing logging? Uh, and again, Please, uh, there's so many things I want to get into here, the time's limited, but I want to tailor this to you. So if you're interested in some bit and I'm ripping by it too quick, stop me and I'm happy to dig in. So let's, let's back up to the PC. Microsoft had a vision statement in 1975, a computer on every desk and in every home, which today sounds really boring. But in 1975, this was a crazy and wild idea. Um, Bill Gates talked about this. Like people would say, yeah, at the time in 1975 when they said that, people would go, why on earth would you need a computer? Why would you want to do this? You know, what's the reason why? And um, here's a famous quote. There's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home by Ken Olson, who is the head of Digital Equipment Corporation. And by the way, the boss of Gordon Bell, who I later worked on with the My Life Bits. And so Ken has been roundly mocked ever since for having said such a thing. But let's be fair to Ken. What is the reason why? Let's back up. Because after all, he looks rather foolish. Computers did go onto pretty much every desk in businesses and onto nearly all homes. But when he said this, when Microsoft put out their wild and crazy statement, it really was wild and crazy. The only thing Microsoft sold at the time was the, a basic compiler for the Altair. And the quote, there's little you can actually do with an Altair. That's from Microsoft's official history. So what led to people saying with this machine you can't really do anything with? Oh yes, in every home. So at the time, actually, Ken Olson sounded pretty smart. And certainly for five years he was really right on. There was less than 600,000 personal computers sold until 1979. So what happened then that changed all this? What was the reason why in the 1980s? Well, I went back and I looked at some advertising from the era to get a handle on it. So here's HP giving you five good reasons to buy their early PC. And the leader is spreadsheets. So what changed in the 1980s, I would say, is primarily the advent of the spreadsheet. Uh, here's Apple being really hip and cool as Apple is. We've invented the personal computer again. But what are they leading with? Spreadsheet. So they're hip and cool, but the reason why businesses started adopting it was they said, look, we can run spreadsheets. This is fantastic. Now, there were other apps also, but the spreadsheet was really <coughs> driving it. So we now had a reason why for every desk. And by 1989, by the end of that decade, 
21 million PCs sold every year. Now only 15% in homes. So Microsoft's vision on every desk and in every home was still sounding a little bit crazy. Businesses had a good reason, but um, now I'm gonna show my age. I can remember that era and you were either a geek or an accountant if you had a computer in your home at that time. It was not what every average person wanted to do. So how about the 1990s? Now things start to change and how they change is with the web. Web and email became a reason why you would want a PC in your home. So 1993 we had the first popular web browser going up, but 10 years later 62% of American homes had PCs and 55% had internet access. Of course, this is a great reason why for even more businesses to pile on as well. So we went through these two distinct areas of a reason why you would want to do this in your home, or in your office, sorry, and then why you would want to do this in your home. And here we see how PC sales took off over the time. You can see they were relatively minute in the 80s and then it's in the 90s when they go up into that steep trajectory. So I want to, the reason I start with PCs is to take your attention to a great example of computer class formation. And to get you thinking about why does the average person want to do this and what tech makes the class possible. So now I'm going to shift gears into, we talked about the reason why, now let's talk about enabled by. What enabled that happening? So let's go back, you've all heard of Moore's Law. Uh, back in 1975, Gordon Moore updates his 1965 prediction. So he used to say that IC density would double every year. He said, all right, I've been right for 10 years, but I'm going to back off, I'm going to say it's going to double every two years. And then some people modified and said, well, it's 18 months. But he essentially is predicting this doubling of density of integrated circuits. And really, it's not a law, it's more of a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's happened long enough and now uh, CEOs demand of their engineers and they have to keep trying to hit that target, which they kept doing for decades following. And what it meant was ever more powerful computers at about the same price. Uh, and it's also held true for storage, by the way, which later got dubbed as Crider's Law. <coughs> so here's a little chart showing what you get for the bang for the buck on, uh, over time. And then um, and everyone, we kind of expect this now, right? We're, now it's more, we're maybe more focused on our phones. Do our phones get faster every year? We get something better model all the time. So that's Moore's Law. And that was a lot of what was behind um, the whole Microsoft phenomenon and their predictions. They said, yeah, we know we have this Altair and it's really lame. But we also believe Gordon Moore and we think it's going to get better and better and better so we could see good things coming. Now Gordon Bell has his own law, Bell's Laws of Computer Class Formation. And this, it's similar to Moore's Law, it, but whereas Moore's Law says, hey, next year you'll buy kind of the same thing, same price, but it'll be twice as powerful. Bell's Law says eventually this means that you could get something at the constant performance but decrease price and size. So that old performance will also shrink and it'll become cheaper. And eventually it'll mean a new class of computing will emerge. And this should happen about every decade. So we used to have mainframe computers and those kept getting more and more powerful. But meanwhile, mini computers emerged. And then those started getting more and more powerful according to Moore's law. But we saw workstations and PCs. And so we see these classes emerge. Now, you could see this as a corollary to Moore's law in the sense that, okay, two years from now, double the density of the chip, we could simply print the same thing twice, slice it in half, voila, I have uh, the, same, the same thing as last time, but half the size, half the price. But it's more than just that, because many computers emerged before there was a Moore's law, before they were even doing transistors. And also, it's not just about being smaller and cheaper. It's not just saying, oh, I have a, you know, I had a desktop PC that I was surfing the web with and now it's half the size and it's costing half as much. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's saying it's actually something really different. There's new ways of using it, new industries, platforms, and applications emerging around it. And by that definition, by the way, Gordon would argue that the home PC was a new class. So that whereas you had the, the desk uh, you know, the desktop PC for the businesses that were running the spreadsheets and so on. There was something not only about the emergence of the web, but also about the price point. That when the PCs got cheaper, 
uh, and they got a little smaller and more compact to go in homes and they were used in a new way that people were um, now uh, oops I'm out of slide I've lost a slide all right um, People were now, uh, say, shopping, all right? So there's a whole new Amazon and that sort of ilk of things. It's a whole new industry has emerged. There's a whole new platform, whole new way of doing things. So it's not just that the PC was cheaper and a little smaller, it's that it's also used in a brand new way. So then if we see it in this light, uh, minis were used in new ways that went from kind of the company computer to the department's computer or maybe something specialized in a scientific application. Uh, workstations got very powerful. Uh, and people started doing graphics and CAD applications and things like that. Of course, we talked about PCs. And then as we all know, tablets and phones get used in entirely new ways than the PCs that preceded them. And then we could keep going here, right? So we, now we get things into watches and all kinds of tiny devices and so on. And each of them eventually are used in brand new ways, brand new industries. Right. All right. So we've talked about sort of the PC era, the reason why that took off, what enabled by, and now I want to talk about two predictions that I've been involved with, life logging and thing logging, and what I think about the reasons why and the enabled by, and why I think these things are happening. So uh, going back to 1999, uh, Gordon Bell and I started with uh, just asking what would it be like if you digitized your whole life. It spawned our whole My Life Bits project. We ended up uh, doing a workshop and funding 14 universities and giving them sense cams and software and all the people in the universities like yourselves did all kinds of cool things we could have never even imagined and at the end of all of it we said well we started out saying what would it be like if you digitized your life and we decided the answer is wow this is a big deal this is a huge deal and also if we look at the reasons why and what it's enabled by we think we can predict that this is going to emerge in the next decade. So we predicted that between 2010 and 2020 that life logging would emerge to the point where you'd be able to record as much of your life as you wanted and that more and more people would be doing various aspects of life logging because of the benefits. And that was the central premise of the book that we published. So our 2009 prediction. So why do we believe this? Well, first of all, we said this is going to be enabled by an explosion of new kinds of sensor devices, ever more compact, and storage increasing. So uh, I remember when we began, a typical PC had an 80 gig hard drive, and we said, well, by 2007, you'll have a be able to buy a terabyte hard drive for your PC. And um, by the way, I'm going to get in later of how expectations change. So we got in the back of the napkin and said, right, terabyte, what could you do? So what if you recorded everything you ever read? And, and what if you recorded a copy of every web page you ever saw? And let's be crazy and rule audio voice grade for eight hours a day. And let's be really crazy and take 10 photos a day. <sighs> Wild, huh? And anyhow, we ran that out and saw that that would take about 65 years to fill a hard drive. So we went, wow, okay, uh, a terabyte, a terabyte hard drive. So we went, okay, this could this could be for real. So that's kind of what kicked off the whole thing, that we saw storage uh, moving that direction. But what's the reason why? We didn't know necessarily. We just said, you'll be able to do it, so it'll be enabled by. But we didn't know why. We said, let's just try it. So we were just playing around. And what emerged were all kinds of fascinating applications, from helping your memory to your health, education, productivity, and just telling your story. All right, so it's been nearly 10 years. I'm nearly at the end of my deadline to 2020. How's the prediction working out? Well, you all have your opinion. You can all chime in here on my incomplete little survey here. Uh, point of view cameras. Here's, here's a shot from just one review site trying to keep track of all of them. There's lots more of all kinds of shapes and sizes all over the place. Um, and I even see Google positioning clips as, as not a wearable camera, but yet something different in video segments and blah, blah, blah. So that's ex absolutely exploded. Um, it's exploded into special professional niches also. Uh, cameras, especially for police officers, especially for uh, people driving various trucks. Or ta actually, I'm, on my taxi into Dublin, um, this truck came to the edge of my taxi and, and clipped his rear view mirror. And the guy got out and shook his fist at him and he went around, took a picture of his license plate and the truck driver was shutting back and he said, ah, but I've got it all recorded on you. 
and he had one of these at the front of his. And so I got a, an experience of the, you know, the life logging of a taxi driver in practice. <clears throat> All kinds of software uh, has come and some of it has gone already. So a bunch of things that I'm showing here have like tried and failed already, which is not that unusual uh, in the world of startups. But it's maybe been a little bit disappointing. Evernote, uh, their CEO told Gordon that he was inspired by the whole My Life Bits thing and, and certainly when I record little web pages off of Evernote today, that's the replacement for my old My Life Bits plugin that I used to have. Uh, that's been maybe the most resounding success software-wise. Wearable fitness devices like crazy, uh, all kinds of bracelets for sure, armbands, a ring, uh, smart watches like crazy, you all know all these things, home health monitoring, you name it, what you want to measure it, you can pretty much do it at home. Also, I was talking to uh, a couple of doctors just a few weeks ago, and I, I don't know about your trends here, but they're saying, you know, the fo economic forces are going to be pushing more and more into the home. So we're just at the beginning of this. So it's not just the tech, but we talk about a reason why most of the healthcare systems are in, in big trouble and they're going to be trying to gain things first of all, out of the hospitals into the clinics, out of the clinics into the pharmacies, out of the pharmacies into the homes. So this is just going to continue to accelerate. I love these little ones. These are fun. The pill you can swallow for your temperature or the, the Proteus sensor here, which is shown beside the end of the pin. Uh, I think their first commercial application now is embedding it into a little pill that you swallow that interestingly is keeping track of whether you take your other pills and they're using it for schizophrenics and people who it really matters to keep them on their meds and it actually measures whether they're staying on their meds. Um, so that's fun. Yet more, if you get your knee replaced, you can have an inbuilt sensor to keep track of it to help uh, fine tune things, shirts you can wear, and an implantable eye pressure monitor if you have a condition in your eye. Um, and there's much more. And what really gets me is, so I went, Walgreens is a chain of uh, cheap you know, drug stores, pharmacies uh, near where I live, and I was able to go in and just snap a bunch, here's, they have a whole rack on the shelf. So it's gone from the research labs to a rack on the shelf at the pharmacy near me. So that's really taken off. Uh, of course, it's not just hardware. Um, the idea of things being born digital, I guess, th I, this, this is a little bit like the Microsoft statement sounding uh, boring to people now. This probably sounds boring to you now also, but back when we started, this was something we dreamed of, is that instead of scanning, so with Gordon, we, he hired a personal assistant, she spent two years pretty much full-time scanning, just putting papers on scanners and scanning and photos and all kinds of stuff, trying to keep up. Now it's absolutely astonishing the amount of your life that's born digital that doesn't need to be scanned. So whether it's movie tickets or coffee purchases or you know you name it almost, yeah, there's, a, there's a variation where it could be born digital, which is, I think is a huge deal. And of course this leads to the digital existence of a person. So you can, uh, there's even you know, not just the digital trail of me buying physical coffee, but then me listening to digital uh, music, streaming digital movies, uh, you know, posting things and so on. So the stuff that's just my digital existence as well. So what will we say? Uh, with only a year and a half to go, how's the prediction working out? I would say, well, you could record as much of your life as you like. So if I, if I wanted to be really, uh, if I wanted to spin this the best case for myself, I'd say, ta-da, did it, yay, we're there. You could, but what's the reality? What am I disappointed in? One is, uh, we used to use this phase during the project of, you know, what does the average person want? Keep it together, keep it forever. So this is this shift from, uh, how do I say this? What, you know, again, I talked about there was a day when only a geek or an accountant would have a computer in their home. In the same way, there was a day when only a geek or accountant would actually do a backup. You had these floppy disks or you know, CDs or whatever it was, and wow, you actually do backups. And to me, the day when you saw an ad for a backup on television, a backup service, showed we've crossed a divide. 
to where it actually makes sense for the average person to care about keeping their data. And I think part of it is these, these, is these special memories. They say that in a fire, most people, they'd say the number one thing they'd run back to save would, be, would have been their old photo album. Like that's how much it meant. And in the same way, all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, you have my photo memories? Those better be backed up. Those better be protected. There's a, um, you know, I expect you to keep it forever. That's what people want. And the keep it together is that Right now, what's really um, not acceptable in, in our typical lifestyles is our silos of data, that our emails and our email world, and our photos are maybe in some photo service, and our health data is in some other health data service, and there's, you know, things, um, you know, I use, if I, you use the Strava app to track where you run, that's just in Strava, so things are kind of siloed. And, it's inconvenient in so many ways. It's inconvenient just in terms of managing it over time and wanting to keep it. Uh, but of course, one thing we encounter very quickly is that multimodal search is so much more effective that your memories aren't all, you know, always going to obey the silo for when you want to retrieve it and that you may be looking for, you know, I'm looking for that photo that I took on the hot day or I'm looking for the, you know, the email that happened when I was in a certain location or things like that. So. You really want things together. And this has not happened. And also nobody seems to be pushing in this direction. Like the forces out there in the world seem to actually be going in the reverse direction of trying to keep things separate for you. So that's not good. And also, I talked before about my expectations rising. So I went from saying, wow, 10 photos a day would blow my mind. Now that's not even close to adequate. And of course, my resolution expectations have gone way up as well. But also, automatic labeling. So even if you did keep it all together, are you, you know, do I just have a bunch of uh, PDFs with gobbledygook names on them? Or do I understand this is my utility bill, this is my bank statement? Do I understand this is my bank statement from this date? Can I understand this was a bill from my dentist for $300? Um, this kind of labeling is really necessary to get the advantage out of most of this in some way or another. I definitely want that. Affordability of cloud storage. So back when we were writing the book, cloud was just this kind of new concept and it seemed kind of handy. It's, I think most people now it's like the hassle thing. It's like, yeah, I could have a bunch of hard drives back in my home to back things up, but we're all getting used to cloud storage. But on the other hand, I don't know about you, but I'm constantly in the world of Apple telling me that I've maxed out my iCloud storage and other services that I've also used tell me I've maxed out their storage and it's just not affordable enough yet. So uh, more affordability cloud storage and then battery experiences. So. When I was in the research world, I put the kind of effort that you all would put into it. I'm willing to go through a bunch of pain to do my research. I stopped the research, I go, wow, this better be really easy. I'm not gonna fuss around with 10 different devices with 10 different cables and so on. I want batteries that last a long time. I wanna just throw them all on an inductive mat. I want, you know, make it easy for me. So, um, again, how did the prediction work out? We said, Look at this is enabled by trends in storage and sensors. We can see all the reasons why. How is it working out? Well, in general, it's working out really well in the decade. But our, as we got into it, we realized maybe there's more we should be asking from it. The, the requirements increase. And this is typical if we get time at the end to talk about you get into business as a startup, it's almost like a pivot, right? It's all, or, you know, it's like, let's get this to market and fail fast. Well, we got to market and we all learned, uh-oh, we actually need this other stuff if it's going to work. So I think the prediction has worked out kind of in the broad sense, but now we've learned a bit more. We learned, you know what, actually, we need to solve a few more things to make this really uh, have mass appeal. Which leads me to thing logging. Uh, so. One way to view uh, the, you know, the work in computer science over the last 50 years or so is this spiraling quest with everything in cyberspace. This is from a 1997 presentation talking about how between whether it's communication or I.O. or storage, whatever have you, it's like more and more things in life. It started out with just kind of really you know, industrial or scientific problems and that's in the business and that's in the home. We're just putting more and more things into cyberspace and our networks are, you know, started out from offices or so on, uh, grew upwards to campuses and internets and so on. And meanwhile, they're also shrinking down into, you know, down till they're right inside our bodies and so on. 
And uh, they're going beyond the world, aren't they? Out into outer space even. So, um, what will happen with thing logging? Well, here's one uh, vision about saying, well, all things should be self-identifying and tracked. And the idea is like, we could get to this vision where literally everything, you know, like this table here would be able to know, you know, who it is, where it's being, it'd be, I have an identity that I was built in a certain factory, shipped to a certain store, bought by this person, and we could have that kind of knowledge. That's one, one view of it. Uh, then the hot buzzword, you know, internet of things, internet of things. What does it mean for actual, real internet of things? So all things to be on the internet. So what would it mean? It's one thing to say that last one, the table's identified and tracked. It's another thing to say it's actually on the internet. Or I like to ask, how long until I can ping my glasses and actually get a response where they're, they're really on the internet? Um, on one sense, we can say again, hey, the trend, long-term trend is everything going into cyberspace. So yes, but how long? Someday, I, and what I think is that things, according to their value and the amount of data that they generate or have about them, go through four phases towards being fully Internet of Things. So first of all, they're interesting enough that we log them. So we just start saying, right, I know I own this MacBook, I'm going to keep track of that. I, you know, I have information about it. Or you, know, you think of the campus probably has inventory systems and so on. That's first of all. Second of all, we say, okay, well, we could track them. So maybe they have some kind of RFID chip or something like that. So we can say, all right, well, um, I know that uh, we're keeping track of the pianos at the music school, and we actually know what room we've rolled them around to and so forth. Uh, and then they could become peripheral. So maybe they speak Bluetooth to your phone, and so they're kind of second-class citizen. And finally, if they're important enough, they become fully internet connected. So what I mean by value and data is, uh, like cars are a no-brainer. Like you, your vehicle, it's worth a lot. It's got all kinds of interesting information about it and so on. It's like a no-brainer that those quickly get fully onto the internet, they're right there. And then you see things about connected home, right? Like your home's high value, there's a bunch of information about temperature and energy use and so on that's happening. But then other things, maybe not so much. Um, and depending on what the item is, it's going to go through this progression. And I think actually the vast majority of things will just be logged to begin with. So they won't even be tracked. We'll just want to know about them. And that's the inspiration behind um, what we're looking in terms of the trend. And the, and the trend in what's enabling thing logging is plentiful and secure cloud storage, techniques and uh, technology that let us collect information more easily and then web services that let us now take the fact that we're logging or tracking things and get advantage back from it. Um, so in particular, how we can get the information, uh, we've played with nearly all of these over time at Trove. So ingesting things out of electronic receipts, loading lots of popular databases to do with, uh, you know, whatever kind of thing is, whether it's uh, we're using Zillow for home information or things to do with car information or all kinds of shops, shopping sites where we find out about different objects you can buy. We have scanning for barcodes and QR codes. And on the high end, which I'll talk about in a bit, we even, you can talk about appraisers who do things on site or about being able to tap into expert communities who can offer opinion, or you can be right in the point of sale and connect when people are buying things. So lots of ways of getting information about how people buy it. And then why? Why would you do this? Why would you want to know about all the things in your life? Well, it turns out there's a lot of advantage you can take. You can ensure things. You may want to share information. Uh, you may want to sell or buy. You might want to have values on things. Uh, maybe you need something serviced. Maybe you're going to be moving. Um, we've talked to um, banks who say you could be using this as collateral on your loans or to help understand your profile for your credit better according to what you own and the ability to give things. So the idea is that, you know, to summarize it's you want to be able to do stuff with your stuff. Uh, another reason why, or a, you know, a catalyst behind this is in the next 30 years, there's going to be $30 trillion worth of wealth transferred from the last generation to the next generation. You know, as, as the baby boomers age out, it's going to be uh, $2.7 billion a day transferred. And it's going from what we call the last analog generation to the digital natives, 
who are vastly different people. Um, not just in that one's handing the wealth on to the next, but also that you take a generation who likes to go in and talk to a broker or an agent or anything like that to a generation who says, no, I just want to be hands-on, online. I want to be connected all the time. Um, i institutionally averse. I don't trust big corporations. I'm dependent on the cloud and I'm much more self-disclosing, like different in so many dimensions. So all this wealth is coming to a generation that wants to do things differently. So based on all that, what you know, the enabling bit and the reasons why, just like Microsoft had their crazy and wild idea that there'd be a PC on every desk in every home, we say everything that everyone owns will be in the cloud for their personal use. Um, which maybe sounds wild and crazy also, but I think it's inevitable. So this leads to the little uh, segue here of between my life logging world and my thing logging world. Uh, this is my sense cam capturing Scott Walchuk having breakfast with me here and he's saying, uh, this is in the end of 2011, he's saying, Jim, I want to start a company that has the greatest corpus of knowledge about what people own in the world. And I said, wow, that sounds like something from my book. Did you read my book? And he said, no. And I said, well, you should, because we talk about things like this. And I know this pain point from Gordon. Um, this is amazing. I'm in. Uh, I, want, I want to go do this startup with you. So, uh, our first idea was to say, right, how do we get this started? Again, long-term vision, everything everyone owns in the cloud. But early on, Scott's idea was that let's go after rich people. They got a lot of stuff. They got a lot of money. They got a lot of pain. And so we were creating software for clients who were like professional sports players, movie stars, things like that. They had multiple homes uh, with beautiful places in the mountains. We had well, it's kind of washed out, you can't see it, but we had complete floor plans for them. And then in the room, we'd know where all the things actually were and information about it. And then they had a staff that they worked with. So it'd say, okay, this person needs to do the HVAC system on this time. And I, yeah, maybe at the end, we get more questions. But we had, you know, some of the inspiration for this was the person going to their other home and not knowing how to reset the bowling alley in the basement. You know, so it's kind of crazy, wealthy, rich people stories. And they had a lot of pain, and it was good. So uh, we had a bunch of clients, and we are charging them big subscriptions. But, um, you know, it was a slow sell thing, and it's hard to actually talk to these people. And it's not very fun when you can't actually speak to your e ultimate end customer <laughs> if you're trying to get feedback on how your software is doing. Uh, and it was, um, you know, it was never going to be mass market. Um, so we were really challenged as uh, we, we, at first we thought, well, we'll do this for maybe five years and then we'll figure out how to go down market. But we also had a kind of aha moment where one of our customers came to us and said, hey, can you help me sell this rug? They had this Persian rug, and, which was not a service that we offered, but it turns out that if you're really wealthy, you can't trust people. You think that everyone wants a piece of you. And so once you get into their inner circle, they'll tend to ask someone in their circle first rather than reach out to someone new. So we we're kind of the closest thing to that. So they said, will you help me sell this rug? So we said, okay. And then we discovered we could make more on the commission of selling this rug than we were going to charge. It was going to be equivalent to three years worth of subscription. We went, oh, that's interesting. It got us thinking about transactions. We said, well, if we knew all the things in your life and we could be involved in the transactions around those things, we could make money off of that. I said, oh. That's a, that's a pretty big idea. And then our, our board got a little bit worried. They said, well, what if someone uh, made an announcement that a venture capital firm had given them $20 million and they're going to do this, they're going to suck all the oxygen away from you. So our CEO said, well, why don't I make that announcement? So he started going to talk to venture capital firms and saying, hey, you should put money into us. And they said, great, we love the idea, but we don't love this few rich people thing. We, how are you going to get a million customers? And we said, whoa, 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 we didn't want to think about that for several more years. They're like, we don't care. If you want our money, tell us how you're going to go after the mass market. So now we had a problem. Why would the average person do this? A lot of the reasons, if you looked at the advantages that I gave to having all your things online, are delayed gratification. Well, you should have an item in your trove because a few years from now when you sell it, it'll be much easier. You'll just click it and we can post it on eBay. True. 
but is that really going to motivate you today? You should have it in your trove because if you need it serviced, well, we can have that ready to go. True, but you're not feeling that pain today. And we looked at all that and said, well, we think that what really comes first is insurance. Uh, both that it should come first as an emphasis for trove before we tackle those other things, but also if you think that when you first buy something, it's not broken yet. You don't need to sell it yet. You, you know, you're not arranging some kind of future thing, but you may need to insure it right now. So I said, right, we're going to focus on insurance first. And we found um, insurance partners to work with us to do the actual underwriting, uh, developed a, ended up developing our own insurance platform stack in the cloud to do all this to where we can actually quote a price on the insurance and start the insurance and bill you. And we have a nice little claim bot that'll talk you through a claim and be really nice to you and do it quickly and conveniently. Um, and uh, we even, while we're at it, we realize, well, if we're gonna do this and we're gonna start and stop claims, we might as well price it down to the second. So we kind of accidentally came up with a, a micro duration insurance product, which uh, turns out to be interesting. Uh, and then we have, uh, let's see, I'm going to skip past this for the sake of time. This is showing some of the shots from our, uh, you know, you can, again, add items to your trove, get instant quotes on them, instantly start or stop your coverage. And, um, but we're not an insurer. So we take on underwriting partners, so we have no risk in the game. We are just the service that takes care of it. So we interface with the customer. We service them, do everything for them, but somebody else underwrites it. So we started with Suncorp in Australia. Uh, they were the first partner to get in with us. We then tried to show that it wasn't a fluke, that we could do it twice. So we got AXA in the UK and launched in the UK. And now we've got Munich Re, who's a reinsurer, uh, to launch in. Uh, the United States. And later on, if you're interested, I think there's some interesting business angles here about disruption in the insurance industry that I'll talk about insurers versus reinsurers. Uh, right, so that's what Trove has gotten into. We've got this uh, on-demand micro in duration insurance product, launched it twice now. We're now being, uh, oh, and uh, recently uh, we announced that we've partnered with Waymo to cover riders in their self-driving cars. So that again, this is where this pricing of the second thing turned out to be really handy that we could say, well, you're just, we're only covering you for these kind of very limited durations, but we know exactly what it is. Uh, we've had a lot of interest now. We're getting ready to uh, build and launch auto insurance products where the big picture concept is that we're at an inflection point in history again. And again, if we look at where tech shifts are happening, that we're going from people owning their cars and driving them towards more and more driverless cars, more and more not owning the car, whether it's you know sharing or renting or what have you, that needs special coverage. So we're getting involved in auto insurance. And then we're also looking at different ways of distributing our business um, to uh, maybe uh, not be so tied to our own brand or our own app, but to support, you know, whether it's uh, shopping websites, uh, doing things under their own brand, or banks doing things, or things like that. So, um, there we go. Sorry, I, I was kind of racing through all that at the end because I wanted to leave it open to you because there's a lot here to do with, um, to sum up again, there's, you know, as technologists, we can think of what's enabling things. And we can say, of course, it's inevitable. It's inevitable that such and such will happen. It's inevitable we have all these sensors. It's inevitable that we'll be able to do more machine learning. We can see all these things coming. But when you combine it with, well, what's the reason why for the customer? I think that really helps us get to good predictions about what will emerge. And I hope that um, the experience with Trove is kind of interesting, I think, because we started out with a reason why around wealthy people and their pain points, and you can see us struggling around that reason why. Just like if I back up to the beginning, Microsoft says, well, something's going to happen here, and we know it's inevitable as technologists, but they didn't know the spreadsheet was coming, and they didn't know the web was coming later. Um, and so it's figuring out that that brings us from the world of research to how do we apply it. Um, Sorry for rushing, but I hope I covered that. I, I'd be happy to answer any questions now. Yeah, sure, we can probably get through.